Before I start, um, there's always one thing I've always wanted to say. Welcome to my TED Talk. <laughs> Statistically, about 40% of all population are afraid of flights. And about 100% of parents are terrified at the thought of flying with screaming, restless kids. Here's an interesting story. I was on a plane to Nashville with my wife and two kids. And according to the fake statistics that I just made up, <laughs> this was going to be a terrifying experience. So we did everything that we could to prepare. We were prepared for the worst. We, hit, we bought a brand new tablet, and, just, and we stocked it up with uh, Daniel Tiger videos, uh, a backup phone, just in case the tablet died, and then we had snacks and everything that you would need to keep our toddler calm and rested on her seat. But it turns out, we didn't need Daniel Tiger after all, and I probably finished like half of the snacks. <laughs> so what happened was my daughter, she sat down, and she took out the airline safety brochure, she just kept staring at it. <laughs> she was fascinated by the pictures. So I did what every millennial dad would do in case of miracles. Take out my phone and take a picture. <laughs> my followers have to know. Remember fix or didn't happen, very important. <laughs> so for a while, my daughter, she became hyper-focused on that piece of paper. And then she passed out. And needless to say, it was a happy, happily ever after ride. So I learned a very important thing. I learned that visuals are very powerful tools of communicating information, even for kids who, can't, who can barely read. I work as a data specialist at MSU Extension, and my day-to-day -day job involves looking at spreadsheets, turning complex information into actionable insights. And oftentimes, the result of that data analysis is in the form of visualization, something that looks like this. I've learned that the reason why data visualization is important in any data analysis is actually very simple. Data in its, actu is, in its natural form is actually very complex, and visuals have a way of representing that complexity in a physical way, shapes, colors, and maps. And to understand this better, let's look at why we need data visualization. Let's look at through the 1800s. So this was the time during the cholera pandemic. A lot, of, a lot more people have died compared to what we have right now. Millions have died in Russia and in Great Britain. And then the theory was that cholera was spread by air, was airborne. But then there's this guy, his name is Jon Snow, not to be confused with the other guy from Game of Thrones. This is Dr. Jon Snow, so he's a physician in London. So he had a theory that cholera was actually spread by water. It was a waterborne disease. He had all the data to prove it, but then nobody believed him. His theory was rejected. And he was adamant and he thought, you know, maybe there's something wrong. Maybe I should present my data differently so people can understand better. So he drew a map. He pinpointed the deaths on a map, and as you can see, my vaguely see the points, the black dots on the map, the center of the map. And then he overlaid the map with water pumps. And it was clear. That was a pattern. All deaths pointed to a single water pump on Broad Street. Long story short, pump was closed, and Dr. Snow became the father of epidemiology. Visuals, like charts and maps, are very powerful tools of illustrating patterns and trends, which is why we use charts and maps today for data analysis. So other than playing around with charts and maps, the other part of my job as a data specialist is to spread data literacy. How many of you have heard of data as the new oil? You know, everybody probably heard of that. And the thing is that data in itself doesn't actually have any value. I, mean, I, can't, I can't trade a car with an Excel spreadsheet. Doesn't work like that. But what data as a new oil means is that data, when harnessed with the right tools and right techniques, can be very valuable to how we operate on a daily basis. To understand this stat, I'm going to introduce you to a model. It's called the DIKW model. If you don't know what that means, it's right in front of you. 
Some people are really bad at acronyms. So the DIKW model is, describes a theory in how we derive data. To illustrate, you know, let's imagine you, you're driving a car and then you see a red circle. Doesn't actually mean anything. That red circle registers your brain as raw data. It's a color and it's a shape. That's data. But then it only becomes information when you add meaning to it. And you realize it's not just a red circle, it's a traffic light. That's information. And it only becomes knowledge once you add context to it. And you realize that that's not just a traffic light, you're driving towards a red light. But then it only becomes wisdom once you decide to act on it. <laughs> and that is why data can be very valuable to how we operate on a daily basis. Now, the thing is, in a lot of cases, the same data can be used with the different context and different meaning to change the whole response to it. Let's take a look at this example. You've probably seen this one. It's a map of the COVID-19 virus spread. And the, the red circles represent the number of cases of COVID-19. And one look at it, and you realize that it looks like the beginning of every disaster movie out there. And it makes you want to buy a hazmat suit ASAP. Now, what if, what if we take the same data and visualize it differently? Maybe change the background map a little bit, make it lighter, or change the red into something friendlier? Looks a lot different now. Now, the difference between the map on the left versus the map on the right is not the data, the same numbers, but the way in which you manipulate context and meaning and it changes the responses to it entirely. The difference between the map on the left versus the map on the right can be the difference between getting a hazmat suit and getting a face mask or washing your hands more often. And this is why visuals are very powerful tools of invoking emotions. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what the data says. What matters is how it makes you feel. And this only works with visuals, not text. So to illustrate, let's look at the series of texts. It will take you a while to realize that there's a pattern. It's describing a pizza. But then take one glimpse at this image, and you realize that this is definitely a pizza. See, our brain processes visuals much faster than it does with text, which is why Digital marketing companies have understood this potential. In 2016, a company called Cambridge Analytica utilized this concept in a large scale. And they were uh, very famous for it, very infamous for it in the 2016 election. So they did two things. Number one, they mined data from Facebook profiles to create different personas based on personalities, tendencies, attitudes, and interests to form different categories of people. This is a process otherwise known as psychographics. Now, that's just the first part. And they, they, there was a huge contro controversy for this because there's a huge data privacy issue. But a lot of people don't talk about the second part. The second part is where they use these psychographic profiles to micro-target people. They use visuals repeated over and over and over again to influence people who are living in the swing states, people who have high tendency to switch votes, people who are more open to influence them to vote for their client. One of their clients is the Republican Party. 2016 election, Hillary Clinton had 66,000 unique ads on Facebook. Unique ads, that's a lot of ads. But what about Donald Trump? He had 5.9 million unique ads. And these are ads not just directly targeted towards winning the presidential, towards their presidential campaign, but ads that are created to create an atmosphere to illustrate, to change the way the voters see the world so that it becomes conducive for their candidate to win. So by now you understand that Visuals are powerful tools at communicating information, illustrating patterns, invoking emotions, and changing the way we see the world. So it's not enough 
for us to just have the right facts at this day and age. But we need to take one step further and think about how we present information. Now, I'm not saying that everyone needs to learn how to create interactive charts. That's my job. And if everyone knows how to do that, I'll be unemployed. <laughs> what I'm saying is that what we need now is not fancy charts or fancy softwares. What we need is a shift in the way we present information. By using more effective visuals, we can communicate information better. It could be as simple as, instead of using that table, changing it into charts. Or, if you're creating a PowerPoint, instead of using bullet lists, change to diagrams. Or if you're really bad at PowerPoint, just make sure to use more photos and images in your presentations and products. If there's one takeaway from my talk tonight, just remember one very important thing. Picks or it didn't happen. Thank you. <laughs>